Can you hear me better like this? Broad. Yes. yes. All right, let's go. Because it's cloudy and we got to get outside and look at clouds. <laughs> so, welcome everybody online on the Zoom call. Welcome to the September 2021 virtual meeting for all of you, but for everyone here at LLCC at NNSF, there's a, what, must be 20 in the room here. So welcome everybody to NNSF. I know there's a few people I've seen that worked here last night that are here tonight. So welcome. We had some fun last night and uh, I know some people saw some things. I saw a few things like Jupiter and we couldn't see the pattern. I decided that was enough and I watched uh, some videos with a uh, couple people. So that was kind of cool. Um, yeah, so, and I guess you that are in the room, if you're, if you're not going to involve you, I know that Jerry's going to talk, but he's going to use his computer, he's going to do it that way, but anybody else, you may have to just step up here, and, because my microphone that's sitting here, that is, is Zoom, so, let's make that clear, so, off we go. Facing the speakers though. So it can be bad for them. You guys have that one. Yeah. Oh, that's for them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, let's see what goes. So here's my slide of all the board members. Let's see, board members that are up here. Well, I guess I'm alone. <laughs> so I'm going to big shoulders. Um, Trina, I know is online. Walt thought he would join maybe later. I think he's in an airplane. Matt Dunham said he would not make it tonight. And Conrad and Gunnar, I don't know. You guys are probably online, but I haven't seen you because I've been being out body this while. So here's a picture of everyone. And there's there's captions for everyone so we can see who's who. Um, so my slide on thank you volunteers this month. Um, there was all the work that everybody did to get ready for up here, everything that's going on up here with Ken and, and, and his crew, um, uh, you know, exceptional. I mean, uh, NSF is going off without a hitch so far, except for those clouds, the cloud nebula. Um, but there's been work parties at ELO. I know they're making big progress on the roof to make that motorized, which is going to be huge. And, you know, anybody can go out there you don't need to take out uh, the Incredible Hulk so you can push the roof back. Now you can just push a button and it'll go back. I've seen videos online, that's gonna be incredible. Um, I know uh, Camping with the Stars happened since the last time we were online and talked. And it sounds like that was a success. There was lots of people. And I know they could have used a couple more volunteers, you know, so that's, you know, that's, that's just the way it goes. Um, Otherwise, there's, and I know there's work, I know there's work being done on the website, and someday we're going to be able to release that thing. I know we're getting closer. I've seen and been paying attention to what's been going on, so that's going to be huge. Um, and before I forget, before I go spend any time on this slide, uh, you know, all you new volunteers, all you new volunteers, all you new members, uh, thank you. I mean, you're the reason for the growth. I mean, it's not, you know, I don't know, is there any new members in this room? within the last year. Yeah, see, there's no new members in this room. So I have to thank these people for continuing to maintain our membership, but then it's the new membership, the new members that make it grow. I mean, us, we're gonna be there every year, but it's those people, we need to convince them that, hey, this is a really cool place to be. And when your renewal comes up, make sure you know, because then you can come up to NSF and hang out with us because I discovered, I think I found a new place to come to hang out because I liked it up here. Um, oh, before I go, just to let her know, just a reminder, I think I'm gonna only do this a couple more months. Just to let you know, if you've tried to use the listener, it doesn't work. It's going to some Google dead email file and never sees the light of day again after you sent it. So. Um, you know, refer back to this video. Um, I think the addresses are online. Um, there's really no excuse for you not to use these Google. These are Google-based uh, um, email addresses to 
and contact whoever you're looking for within the club. Uh, and then there's the Slack tool. It's growing. I've seen a few people join, um, and it's 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 a cool tool. I mean, it's it's got all kinds of features to share files and share video, and you can do you can do calls, you know, video calls one on one. Uh, it's it's kind of fun. Uh, I was talking to Vaults today. He's sitting at the airport bar. And, we're trading, we're talking about things that are going on up here. And I gave him the whole, where's this vortex? What's with this vortex stuff that he showed up here? And I found out that they're a Wisconsin company. And they gave us a bunch of stuff. They, so they're really cool. So we'll find out more about them later on. <laughs> Don't forget the MAS is on YouTube. <laughs> And that's why we record this video. And I, when I get home next week, I will uh, edit it and uh, get it up there as quick as I can. And, uh, you know, refer to it. The best way to find it, you know, even when I'm looking for it, I just go type in my Google or my search engine, Minnesota Astronomical Society YouTube, and it pops right up for me. So it's free. It's, it, it, you, you can find it, you get there get to where you want to go. We have it set up so that there's individual low buckets for monthly meetings and basic things, imaging things. What else is there? Observing. Well, there's no observing things because you guys don't make videos. <laughs> I, think, I think you guys are allergic to changing photons into electrons. Yeah. So that's my, I think you guys have some allergy for that. Here, here, here. Here, here. So anyway, if you're interested in checking out a past meeting, they're all there. And they're easy to find. They're under their very specific channel for monthly meetings. So there you go. There's my pitch for you. I know Anton is in the crowd. If he wants to speak, he can. Oh, oh. Hi, so uh, <laughs> that's uh, oh, that that. I got it. Give me a second, I'll fix it. Okay, so Anton says I should just tell you. So, here, Anton says everything is available, but everything is out. Yeah, so yeah, so so if you if you want something, go online and request it's out. Uh, and we have lots of DVDs. And Anton and I had a conversation this afternoon about that and said, hey, since it's Claudia, I'd be sure about the DVDs because then if we were about the DVDs, maybe they'd be important. Oh, see, there's some thinking right there. I'm just, I'm just telling you. But anyway, you know, we got an awesome lineup of scopes. I know we got a new one on order that we just got notified by High Point Scientific that says it'll be in in late fall, which is an update from it'll be in in the fall. I'm so excited. Can't wait. Well, it's, it's a five inch, right? Or a six inch. So we're getting a six inch SCT that will join that will join the rest of the motor scope program. So kind of excited about that. Events before the next meeting. So new moon's coming. Was that Monday? Is the seventh on Monday? I think it is. Oh yeah, so we'll be gone. New moon. Hard to be clear that thing. And then the 13th is uh, Mercury, the longest, greatest eastern elongation, if you can't see it on that screen. Uh, and then we we're talking about this. Neptune's going to be at op opposition, but the question is, is I think Uranus opposition must be in October, maybe November. Um, and then Saturn and Jupiter are near the moon. And, and then there's the wonderful full moon on September 20th that everybody gets out and enjoys. And then new moon again on. Uh, October 6th before our meeting on October 7th, but before that, of course, not that we care or can look at it or observe it, but Mars is in conjunction with the sun. I only put that in there because, you know, I think a lot of people in this room and a lot of people online follow the things that are going on and the science that's going on on Mars with the rovers. You know, they're basically a blackout period. They don't get any, they don't send any, they don't send any information to Mars and they don't get anything back, so the helicopter will not be flying. 
Um, you saw events coming up, astronomy day is coming up um, at ELO. Uh, I just want to put a plug in there, kind of put the plug in there, even though it's after our next meeting, after, after the next meeting, um, you know, I want to make sure that we get the plug out there and we start saying, hey, they're going to need some volunteers again. Um, it's a, astronomy day is a great event. Um, oh, my microphone just did it. My arm's getting tired. So, Astronomy Day, great place to volunteer, a great place to get out with the public, uh, do outreach. Um, I know there's going to be a call for speakers, so if you got something you want to talk about, that certainly is a great, a great place to uh, do a presentation. And uh, that'd be kind of cool to fill that in and fill it up. Um, and then all the typical things, uh, the night sky tour was clear, and the telescopes everywhere, and it's, it's good. Door prizes, is that on there? So, yeah, door prize drawing. So yeah, it's a good time. And we will have, I think we'll still have COVID restrictions on there. So, and then here is a slide of the star parties, the public star parties. Um, obviously the Northern Knights is still going on and then there's a, a which is public and ELO's got a couple parties coming up and then We'll get to the, the BSIG event here in a little bit. Um, that's still eight o'clock, isn't it, Trish? Start at seven, seven o'clock. Probably seven o'clock. So, okay, so seven o'clock, my slide is wrong, and my future slide is wrong. And then all kinds of member opportunities. If you're a member of the NIS, you certainly can get out there and do some observing at some of our fine uh, fields and observatories. So Northern Knights, I went and took this picture this morning. That's kind of cool. Everybody else set up. It's too bad that there aren't more populations and more scopes on there covered with tarps from the overnight. But that's the way life is. Everybody prepared for the possibility of some rain tonight. So everybody's kind of put away. Uh, so today we had uh, Dick Jacobson talk about his what is it, a 30 inch and a 29 inch? It's really an inch difference, but okay. Um, after you get the 30 inches, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then obviously tonight is the MAS meeting. Um, and then I think we're just gonna observe raindrops and cloud shapes tonight. And then um, tomorrow we have a astrophotography working workshop tomorrow. Um, and then Jerry Jones has a it is the evening speaker tomorrow night. Jerry, I'm looking at you. What, what? And then hopefully there's observing. As there's holes coming. And Saturday, Dave Faulkner's doing this uh, thing on uh, a, a, a presentation on, on uh, Juno. And then Bob King, Astro Bob, Astro Bob from Sky and Telescope is going to be here to talk about resolving and drawing to how to see 2.5 million, see stars 2.5 million light years away. I'm sad I'm gonna miss that. I want somebody to record that for me, please. Um, and then we kind of start winding down. There's kind of a lot of uh, activities going on during the day. There's, of course, there's the slot meet, I guess it's the big thing. And then there's uh, uh, on Sunday, uh, another astrophotography and show and tell that should be fun. And then Monday, kind of the same song and dance. That's going to be going on. So that's what's going on up here. And Ken is not in the room. Right. Is Dave, Dave McMillan, are you online? Are you on the call? I am on the call, yes. Excellent. Then I think if I stop sharing, you can share. Or you can just, can, if everybody can hear me, that, that's good. Yeah, if you just Life. want to talk, I have a slide up for you, obviously, as you can see. Wonderful yeah, game. well, I, I think I look better. Uh, I think that uh, galaxy looked a whole lot better than my face does. So let's leave it at that. So Dave, so tell us about, uh, you're the manager here at LLCC. And, you know, I know you're new. Um, and so... Yep. Introduce yourself to the MAS because I don't know how many people are online, but there's 20 people in this room. 
Well, I'm uh, I'm Dave McMillan. I I guess I'm in uh, my fourth month or so at, at taking over Long Lake, uh, and it's been uh, it's been a wonderful uh, experience. I've I've got to know a lot of people uh, through MAS, uh, and um, including you know Suresh, uh, Ken, uh, Dave Schaff, and others that uh, have been very uh, very kind uh, with their time. Uh, one of the things, uh, you know, not a lot of people really recognize this about Long Lake, but what we are is an environmental learning center. We're nature school and we exist to uh, our mission is to teach uh, primarily kids, uh, but the community at large about uh, about nature and uh, wise use of natural resources. And uh, one of the areas that we used to focus more on and we're focused and, and kind of got away from, but we're going to get back to is uh, astronomy. And we are going to be teaching our fifth and sixth graders who come in about, uh, about astronomy and, uh, and Dave Schaff and Ken and uh, have, have been very uh, kind and, and generous with their time to help, uh, help us work on some curriculum and, and uh, even clean some of the telescopes that we have in the shed that haven't uh, been used in about two years uh, because we've been closed for give or take two years. Uh, when COVID hit, we kind of shut things down and about oh, a month and a half or two months, month and a half or, or so ago, we, we, uh, we reopened for business. And our first group was uh, the Rovers uh, group led by, led by Suresh. Uh, and that was uh, a wonderful, a wonderful thing. We're very uh, grateful for the relationship we have with uh, with MAS, and uh, and what uh, and what you guys bring to us, and and the education that we offer to the kids, and um, and we hope that you guys uh, enjoy uh, Long Lake and the dark skies when uh, when it's not cloudy and rainy. We uh, we hope that we uh, provide a nice venue for you guys to. Uh, uh, to uh, to do astrophotography and and uh, gaze into deep space, so we're very uh, very very thankful uh, that uh, that we have this relationship and hope that we can continue for for a long time. Uh, so that's 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 about it uh, from from Long Lake. I think you've met most of our staff and. Uh, and I, if those of you who are up there, if haven't met, uh, I'll be around all day tomorrow and all weekend long and through Monday as well. So I hope to meet all of you in person. Well, that's fantastic, Dave. You know, I'm, uh, I certainly want to meet you. So come search me out. I want to shake your hand, whatever. And, uh, you know, maybe have a brief conversation. And Absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, so th then there, there, there's that. And then, of course, you know, I mean, just great. I mean, if you get some get some cooperation. Uh, maybe you guys have a connection because you are a nature center. Maybe you have a connection with, with nature. You can, get some <laughs> can, you, can, can you pull a string there or something? <laughs> well, I, I, I pulled in all my strings. It hasn't rained for, uh, for about four months. So I held <laughs> off as long as I could. Uh, oh, so what are you saying? You pulled all your strings and you don't have any left now because you're trying to make it. <laughs> I tried. I tried my best to hold out. I just said, well, so you know what I was thinking? Maybe we have to have like a NSF like every weekend, then, so we can get some rain. Up. Well, you know, I, I am. I am very sorry that you guys are are getting rained on. Uh, hopefully, it'll clear up. But uh, one of our counterparts, learning our uh, RELCs uh, up in uh, in Duluth is on the front lines of that fire and uh you know uh, they 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 need it they need it really badly up there so i i'm happy for them it's sad for you guys but hopefully uh the forecast looks like it's going to be a little more promising for you this weekend and hopefully you'll get get a lot of nice cut nice sky to look at no absolutely thank you very much thank you for joining the call tonight and uh we look forward to a long relationship with you and the rest of the llcc for sure uh, Absolutely, I, I do as well. Thank you for inviting me and letting me uh, letting me talk. Oh, absolutely. That's, what, that's, what, that's why we're here. So yeah, go ahead. <laughs> that's for all the people that I don't know.
Well, I, 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 they, they still applauded me, even though I'm getting blamed for the clouds and rain. I don't know. <laughs> That's the kind of people we are. <laughs> All right. I'll, Thank I'll, you, I'll, take I'll take it. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Uh, just to let you know, you know, we really haven't changed anything about, about COVID. And, uh, I will admit that I'm, I'm a rule breaker right now. I'm not wearing my mask, but there's nobody within six feet for even me. So I'm, I'm probably okay. Um, but we've been, I think we've been pretty compliant up here, uh, at least from what I saw. And, you know, I'm not going to be the police, so police yourself. We're adults. So, and that's kind of the way I look at it from the rest of the the uh, observatories and the other the other uh, locations is you know if you're there and other people are around you know protect them protect them by wearing your mask and you know this so hopefully one day we can have a big party and get together hugs um, be safe so I know Shresh is in the room but I had a conversation with him and I updated my slide. One thing that's different on here is that September 18th, it's at 7 p.m., which is a Saturday. And then Friday, the 17th, that's 7 p.m., is the backup. Um, and just a reminder, everyone, that there's no power at Metcalf Field yet, but we're working on it. So is XL been in? No, but the electrician will be in first on the 16th. Okay, so we have an electrician coming, and he's going to put in whatever he needs to do. And then XL can do their thing to bring in that hot wire and hook it up. And so we could have power back. Well, we won't have power back for the September meeting, but power could be back for the 18th or the October meeting. So that would be kind of cool. That's next year. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so we're going to uh, as always, I want to make a call for everyone for uh, Gem Gemini articles. Um, I haven't heard from a lot of them. Um, in this case, if he's looking for articles, that's a good thing because then that means he has enough until the next issue. But I'm going to remind everybody that after the next issue, there's another issue after that that's going to need articles. So if there's something you've seen, something you've done, something that you just want to talk about, write an article. Um, it doesn't have to be a masterpiece when it goes to him, and uh, he'll help you edit it, I believe. Make it something that that we as an organization can be proud of uh, publishing. So um, take your time, do a, do a write-up, you know, whether it's equipment or even it, there's successes on there. But, you know, if you have a failure, I mean, certainly them, I think it would be kind of interesting to share that, too. Um, I probably could write it. <laughs> Just starting this tonight at seven o'clock. Um, so let's see. Let's next is better know a constellation. Jerry, I was thinking about this. I think I got it figured out. Okay, tonight. Y yes. All right. I'm, I'm gonna. You have to unmute, or is Jerry? We can't hear you, Mark. Ho, ho, how's that? How's that? Oh, there we go. How's that? 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 <laughs> <laughs> Very nice, Jerry. Oh, thank you. Okay. Wait. Oh, this. Can you? Do I? Do I? Do I? Do I? Have a have a echo. Now do I have an echo? Hey, no echo. Awesome. Hi, everybody. This is. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yes, it is. Can you guys hear me online? Yes. Can you guys hear me online? Awesome. Okay, well, hi, everybody. Um, this is kind of weird to be doing this 
with people looking at me. I'm, it's a good thing I'm not in my pajamas. No, don't look at me, don't look at me. That was a weird experience, okay. So um, I'm doing another underdog tonight. Uh, last, last month I did a couple of underdogs and really I'm not so much an underdog, this is more of an under goat. Um, the Capricornus, which is the great scapegoat of the sky. So here we go. Um, this is Capricorn, Capricornus, and this is uh, supposedly what Capricornus looks like from the, uh, the mythological point of view. And by the way, uh, just as a side point, Capricornus is the name of the constellation. Capricorn is the name of the zodiacal sign. So if we're if we're talking about the, the specific constellation, actually, it's Capricornus. So just be mindful of that. Capricornus is the uh, the fortieth smallest constellation of the eighty eight, and it is the smallest of the zodiacal signs. And this is what it looks like. Uh, it is supposedly a uh, um, a fish goat, which is <laughs> kind of funny in and of itself. But there it is half goat, half fish, it's pretty dim. The, uh, the brightest star is only 3.6 mag and that's this puppy right up here. I'm gonna remove the, um, the mythical. And here, this is interesting. So, so this is the, uh, is there a way I can get rid of, excuse me, my apologies, there we go, thank you. Uh, this, is, this is how most of us see it. Uh, this is the traditional outline, kind of the weird looking triangle in the sky. Uh, here's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, somebody thinks, and so this is one other way of looking at it. And you know, in some ways it kind of does look like a goat. I mean, here are the, four, the two legs and here's the head maybe, and here's the, the uh, horn maybe and the tail. I don't know, can you see it? Um, you know, it's kind of there, but but my my complaint about this is that where the heck they're getting all the rest of these stars? Because I don't know. Whenever I've seen it, it since it's not a terribly bright constellation, that's about all I can see. So the reason why I picked Capricornus, along with just kind of liking um, the underdogs of the sky, was that when Mark and I first talked about this, it was supposed to be clear tonight, and. Uh, I really wanted to go out and observe. So I told Mark, okay, Mark, I'm gonna do one that's gonna take me about five minutes so I can get out and observe. Well, that didn't work. So I'm, I, uh, but I stuck with it. So Capricornus doesn't really have an enormous amount going for it, uh, sadly. Um, loser. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's small. So what it does have, I'm getting heckling in the room here. I'm not sure you guys can hear that. Uh, what it does have, it does have a couple of, of, uh, of uh, double stars. This one right here uh, is the, is the uh, El Gedi, the, the Alpha Capricorni. And it's a really quite a lovely, uh, at least for sure, binocular. For those of you who have uh, great eyesight or you're 10 years old, you might be able to see this as a, as a visual, uh, visual double. Uh, the next one is this one down here, uh, Dabney Major, and uh, this is also right here, uh, and this is really quite a lovely uh, double star because it, it has a, a really nice color difference. This is, this is gold and this is blue, so that's pretty cool. That's, a, that's really a, a quite a lovely, a lovely view. Uh, beyond that, <laughs> well, there's, there's there's a Messier object. <laughs> there is one Messier object, M30, which is a globular cluster. Let me get rid of this. There we go. Uh, which is a globular cluster. And it's a good, it's a good size globular cluster. Uh, it's a seven mag. Uh, it, it, uh, it's actually kind of interesting to compare this with M15, which is not too terribly far away. There are really quite a number of, of globular clusters in the area. Of course, this is summer, so there are lots of globular clusters. And so if you're out looking, looking for globular clusters, don't hesitate to make sure you compare lots of them. And you'd find that, that this one has a much less of a core, much less of a bright core that, than M15. M15 is such a magnificent glob. Uh, and that's kind of it, um, except, if we, you know, you think, you know, of course, good old AIU. I mean, here, here are the boundaries of this constellation. 
Do you ever wonder how they came up with these? This is kind of crazy, but this is it. So really, you could imagine that this one might be involved in it, but it really isn't. This is part of Aquarius. And this one over here might be involved, it's M75, and really that's part of Sagittarius. But these are both globs and they're both uh, uh, Messier objects. So, you know, they're in the vicinity. So, you know, why not? Um, there are, uh, there's one other really cool thing uh, that, that is nearby because since really these days, Capricornus is home to two major planets, Saturn and Jupiter. If you go up just a little bit, you get the Saturn Nebula. And the Saturn Nebula, if you're gonna be looking at Saturn, uh, you really ought to try at least look at the Saturn Nebula. Now, the Saturn Nebula is really small. It's 0.4 by 0.5 arc minutes. So it is, it's it's tiny, uh, but here's a here's an image of it. Uh, but you can see why it was it is called the Saturn Nebula. It the uh, the the gases have some pretty uh, uh, ears, I guess the simplest way to put it, on either side. It and uh, it does resemble to some degree Saturn. So let's press on and let's talk a little bit about the planets. So this is a great time to, to look at the planets. They're a little bit higher than last year, not a lot higher, but a little bit higher. So the images are a little clearer. Uh, one of the cool things, if you own a program like this, and by the way, thanks to uh, the folk at, at Sky Safari for uh, supporting these Better Know a Constellation, one of the cool things about this program is that you can zoom in and you can get a pretty good idea of where the planets are or where the where the moons are for Saturn and and so you get some ideas of what's going on, which is pretty cool. If you don't have this program, uh, software BISC has a program that does very similar things, and I believe it's free um, and it's called gas giants. So if you uh, if you don't have Sky Safari, I would encourage you to, to obviously to consider purchasing it, but, but if not, uh, consider getting the, uh, uh, the gas giants on your, on your phone, your iPad. Um, and, and when we get to, uh, uh, to Jupiter, we'll, that'll make a little bit more sense. So you can see here, here are the, uh, the moons around. And some of, the, uh, some of the challenges of observing Saturn, obviously depending upon, so much depends upon seeing. Here's the Cassini division. And I've always felt that if, if I can see the Cassini division all the way around, then my, my telescope is pretty well collimated and the seeing is pretty good. So that's been always kind of an indicator to me. Uh, some other things that I've noticed over the course of the last month when the seeing has really been great, sometimes you're able to see the shading on the inner, on the inner, uh, inner rings and and every now and again, you can sometimes catch some of the other, uh, some of the other rings or some of the other gaps. There are so many different names for these gaps. I'm not even gonna try to remember what they are. Uh, the other things that you can see uh, on, again, on good days, Saturn has such delicate shading, uh, but it's wonderful to be able to see the, the differences in color. And so that's one of the things you wanna really take a look at as you, not only as you gawk at the, at the the, the rings themselves, but but be careful. Look carefully at the different shading of the rings, and especially at the shading of the of the planet. And and try to get as many. See if you can find as many of the the moons. The moons are hard. This makes it look like they'd be a piece of cake, but they're difficult because so many of them are are tenth magnitude, eleven magnitude. There 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 can be pretty bright. And if you be careful that you're not looking at a star. All right, so. That Saturn, there's a, there's, a, there's a moon way about over here for Saturn. And now we're going to, oh, by the way, these are all galaxies. There are lots of galaxies in this area, but they're all pretty faint. So hence the reason why I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. Jupiter is over here. And of course, one of the great things about Jupiter is that depending upon the time, there's a lot of wonderful things to see. And if you have an opportunity to change your time, you can, oops, sorry, my apologies. Oh, I blew it. Let me back out because I didn't center it. There we go. 
So I'm not going to take the time to figure out how to do that again. Uh, many of these programs, what they will do is they will tell you precisely when the great red spot is shown up. And at this point in time, it isn't. The great red spot shows up, but also when these planets will transit or when they will be eclipsed. And that's, and th that's wonderful. So you want to you want to really uh, check that out, and uh, so and and take a look at Jupiter, not just to enjoy the uh, the great red spot uh, and the festoons. Again, if the seeing is good, uh, at least the the multiple uh, the multiple equatorial and and polar belts. And by the way, as I'm thinking about it, um, don't hesitate to use uh, filters either with uh, with Saturn or Jupiter. And if you have only one filter. And I have found in my experience that 80, the blue ADA is the most effective for really pulling out uh, particular uh, aspects uh, of the of Jupiter. And, and so uh, I really kind of become a, a real fan of using filters, both with Jupiter and Saturn in the course of this month. So do take a look at that. Of course, here are the Galilean moons and they're always very cool. I wonder if I should, if I got time to do this, Mark? Yes. Well, I've got time without trying to screw up. I'm going to see if I can center this. And then if I double click it, if I'm staying centered on it, then many of your programs will allow you to do this. Good. Okay. So if I zoom in a little bit more, I'm on month right now. So how about if I change to day or maybe even hour i'll go to hours and then i move forward there we go okay so there's the can you see the red the great red spot so the great red spot is going to show up uh tonight at uh 10 41. everybody jump out there and take a look at 10 41. and 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 this is cool this is one of the real advantages of these software programs that you can now you can time that you can say now i know when the great red spot's going to be out so i'm going to try to make a point of taking a peek at it and not only that but also some of these transits so here for example here's io and then here's the shadow or here's io and here's the shadow of io so uh, if your seeing is good and you've got enough uh, you've got enough aperture enough resolution you're going to be able to watch these puppies go across uh, the, the face of the planet. And that is really fun. And not only that, but then you're going to be able to watch them disappear. Like how, let's see, where are they? Let's see if I can find one that's going to disappear. Ganymede. Yes. Yeah, see, now notice how Ganymede disappeared before. So it, get, it, it disappeared right about here because then it was in the shadow of Jupiter. So there's a lot of stuff to look at in Jupiter. So I um, really encourage you to take lots of time as you're looking at, at, at Jupiter in particular, I know it's so much fun to look at Saturn, uh, but there's so much more, there's so much more activity in Jupiter. It, it's, it's worth just spending as, as much time as, as you can in that situation. So along with that, of course, there are a few other planets that are in the neighborhood or in the hood, as they say. Pluto's over here in Sagittarius. Neptune is over here in Aquarius and way over in aries is uranus so we've got really kind of a lineup of the outer planets here and and that's fun since you're since you're looking at if you've got the sight lines you've been looking at jupiter and saturn you spend some time at the saturn nebula might as well take a look at the other at the other uh, other planets after you've taken a look at these two magnificent double stars that capricornus has to offer and it's one measly messier so and with that I will hand it back over to you, Mark. Are you ready? Are you, should I keep pattering? Turn my mic. Turn my microphone. Oh, good. Good try. Okay, let's see if I can do that. Thank you, Jerry. Um, great presentation as normal. All right, that doesn't have to work. Wait. Yeah, I used it before. Why can't I advance the slide? Oh, boy. all right. So let's see. 
computer is locked up. So I already looked ahead. And the next slide was uh, Jerry's presenting, would be presenting uh, astronomical league awards. He said he has none. I have none. So then that next slide is. Come on, you guys. Get out of the I'm, I am, I'm missing not having a, a observation lists to look at and steal from. So I love, I love reading your brilliant blogs and I, I gain so much and, and so send me more. So, okay, so then uh, the next slide after that from my memory is the, uh, the next meeting. We do not have a speaker scheduled at this time. So I'm gonna see if I can stop sharing so that I can introduce um, Keith Olive and I don't have my slide to, to introduce him properly, uh, but he is from, maybe he can do that. I'll let him do that. So Keith, if you're on, I've stopped sharing. Go ahead and pick it up and, uh, and run with it. And uh, I'm sorry I didn't do a better job of presenting and setting you up. So thank you, Keith. Welcome to, hey, our first uh, hybrid type meeting. Okay, well, I am here. Uh... I can't. normally say I'm happy to I can be see here, your face, but, I'm, but I can't hear you. You can't hear me. Oh, wait a minute. This, the the people go. at home can hear. Okay, yeah. well, we can hear now too. We're in great shape. Thank you. I'm okay, so you can, you can hear me now. Yes, thank you. So I, I would say I'd, I'm happy to be here with you, but uh, I'm actually just at home, so I'm happy to be here as well. But uh, it would have been nice to be able to do this in person and, and see all of your faces, and it would be much easier to handle questions that way. Um, I am Keith Olive. I'm uh, on the faculty at the uh, University of Minnesota and a member of the William I. Fine Theoretical Physics Institute. Uh, so I was asked, let's see, I should, I can share my screen, I think, right? Yes, you can. Um, let's try that. And so now you can, you can see my screen? Yes, we can, thank you. Good. So I was asked to um, talk about uh, some issues in cosmology and, uh, and so the title is A History of the Universe from the Big Bang to today. Uh, cosmology is, is the science of how we, uh, how we describe the universe. And in, in point of fact, there's sort of two kinds of cosmologists. Uh, there's the early universe cosmologist, and then there's another brand of cosmology that's more astrophysical cosmology. Uh, I'll be talking more about the early universe uh, cosmology, as, as, as you'll see. Uh, and to do that, I'll have to also tell you a little bit about some of the fundamental forces in nature and particles in nature, because they're the things that are playing a role uh, in the universe. And so for most of what I'll talk about, it will be uh, what happened in the universe during the first three minutes. And really, that's um, that set everything else, set everything up, and then everything else uh, sort of follow. So just some key words. Uh, the uh, universe is now known to be 13.8 billion years old. Uh, so that's uh, the age of the universe today from what we call the Big Bang. Banding, and that expansion is actually accelerating. Uh, the universe is, for the most part, homogeneous and isotropic. That is, the matter in the universe is, is pretty and it looks the same in all directions. Now, of course, it's not exactly homogeneous and isotropic because all the things that you guys look at, uh, stars and galaxies, uh, are inhomogeneities. Uh, so those things are present. But on large enough scales, the universe is very smooth. Um, it's actually very fortunate because, and I'll mention it again, the, we assume that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic to be able to do any kind of calculation in terms of what actually went on and to be able to make predictions. If you give up those assumptions, it becomes much, much too difficult. 
And so we're actually very fortunate that in the end of the day, the universe is in fact quite homogeneous and isotropic, which makes those calculations viable. So the Big Bang Theory tells us that the universe evolved from some very hot and dense state, and it was initially filled with radiation. And as I said, it's expanding, and as it expands, it cools, and eventually forms some light nuclei, and eventually forms some neutral atoms. That happens much later. Now, very early on, there were some very, very small inhomogeneities, some fluctuations um, that formed. And these, again, are predicted and now, for the most part, confirmed. Uh, and these are the things that eventually uh, grew as time went forward into galaxies and clusters of galaxies. What we know now today is that the expansion is, in fact, accelerating. And whereas we're now, well, we were recently dominated by dark matter, which allowed these fluctuations to grow. It seems now we're dominated by something else, which generically called dark energy, which is driving this accelerated expansion um, into the future. So this is a, a chart. Uh, I helped put this together years ago for the particle data group at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And there's a lot of information. And I'm going to show this chart many times because this, is, this really is the history of the universe for an earlier universe cosmologist. And um, inside the bulk of this thing is, is basically telling you what the constituents of the universe are. And on the left, you see there's all sorts of particles, um, some with names, uh, W, Z, Qs. Um, we'll get to some of those uh, a little bit later. And then there are various events that happen and I'll be describing them in more or less detail, uh, depending on which one we're talking about. As you move to the right, time is going forward as you're moving to the right, and you see that eventually uh, you have fewer things present in the universe and things are clumping up. And eventually as you get uh, farther enough to the right, you eventually have the neutral atoms and eventually you get stars and the formation of galaxies. At the bottom, and so you can refer back to this each time I, I, I come up between, between different epochs, if you want. At the bottom, there's a few scales. Uh, one is a time scale, uh, and that's uh, given to you in, in seconds on the left and years uh, on the right. And you see we start from an incredibly small amount of time, unit of time, 10 to the minus 44 seconds. It's, so it's point with 43 zeros and a one and uh, unimaginably short amount of time. In the middle, you sort of get to times that we can relate to um, 10 to the minus four seconds. It's a 10th of a millisecond, 100 seconds or a few minutes. And then eventually you get into hundreds and thousands of years and billions of years. The next line is the temperature of the universe. And that's uh, the temperature of the radiation in the universe. So today, if you go all the way to the right, it's 2.7 degrees and the unit here is Kelvin. So 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. But at the left, you see the temperature 32 degrees. So again, unimaginably high temperatures. And the, the third line is the typical energy scale in units of GeV, which are uh, and E is essentially the energy equivalent of the mass of a proton. So we have we have this this and we um, uh, let's let's go from there. So I said I wanted to start with the fundamental forces, and uh, they're given here on the left. And uh, so we, we can start at the bottom: electricity and magnetism, uh, which is really in the 1800s realized that that's really just one force, the electromagnetic force. And I, I put some people that are that I associate with, uh, with these forces. Uh, at the bottom, you have uh, Maxwell, uh, who sort of dro drove uh, the study of classical electromagnetism, and then Richard Feynman, who, who, who pretty much developed uh, the relativistic uh, quantum mechanical version of electromagnetism. 
Then there are two weak and strong, uh, weak, uh, sorry, two nuclear forces, the weak force and the strong force. Um, the uh, weak force is, if you want, very simply is uh, what's responsible for radioactivity and fission. Uh, and here I, I show a picture of uh, Steven Weinberg, who uh, unfortunately recently passed away and developed uh, really what is now called the electroweak theory, which I'll show in a second. Strong force, a strong nuclear force has to do with a binding of, uh, of nuclei, uh, a binding of uh, nucleons in nuclei. And here I show uh, Murray Galman, who is, uh, who developed the quark model, uh, which are the constituents of strongly interacting particles. And then of course, at the top, uh, we have gravity. And well, I think everybody knows who the picture is on the right. Uh, in the 1960s, it was realized that the weak and electromagnetic force really are one and the same thing. They are, they're different manifestations of, uh, of what we now call an electroweak force. And, um, and this is now extremely well tested at accelerators, uh, uh, both at CERN and Fermilab and, uh, and other accelerators around the world. In the 70s, there was a hypothesis to unify the electroweak force with the strong force. And that was uh, labeled a grand unified theory. And, and I bring this up because it's gonna play a role in some of the things I'm going to, to talk about. Um, it makes some predictions, but so far those have not been uh, verified experimentally. Uh, and then finally, there is still the drive to unify these forces with, uh, with gravity and the best candidate for that kind of unification uh, goes under the name of string theory. And that started, that development started in the 1980s and goes on today. So let's start with gravity. And I need to get a few concepts across because when we talk about the universe, there are some things about the universe, even just the notion of the universe expanding, that's a little bit hard um, for most people to conceive because you should not be thinking about the expansion of the universe is the sense that there's a bunch of stuff and that stuff is just moving away from each other, moving into empty space. Uh, that's, not what, that's not what's happening. So gravity is really a theory of curved space. And so that again has, a, you need to think about what that means because for all intents and purposes, the way we see space, uh, it appears to be flat. Uh, that shouldn't be a real surprise because we're very small compared to the universe. Just like uh, when you think about the earth and people for ages thought that the earth was flat because well, it looks flat. And uh, to see the curvature, you need to do one of two things and maybe others, but you need to be able to step outside. So if you go out into space, then you can see the earth from a distance and you see clearly the earth is, is curved, it's round. Uh, is spherical. So that's one way to do it. Um, that's a um, little bit hard for the, for the universe. Um, or you can sample large distances. So if you're like Magellan and you get in a boat and you can sail around the earth, then you find that, well, it must be curved because you keep going more or less the same direction and you come back to where you started. So either you can step outside or sample those large distances. As like I said, in the universe, the case of the universe, you can't step outside, right? Well, the earth, we're really talking about a two-dimensional surface. We're talking about the surface of the earth being flat or curved. And so we can go out into that third dimension because we live in three-dimensional space. In the universe, there's no, we would need to do that same trick. We would need to be able to step out into a fourth spatial dimension, which may or may not exist, but certainly not one that's accessible to us. So you can't sample, uh, you can't step outside the universe, but you can sample large distances. And that was famously done as one of the tests of uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity, uh, where it looked at the bending of light around the sun. And so uh, knowing the position of stars, uh, they went out and looked during an eclipse. And uh, that way you could see where that star is. And you see that the star is actually it appears that the star is not in the position that you know it must be yet. And so we, when we look at the out in space, we assume, because that's the way our minds are working, that we assume that the light is coming to us in a straight line. 
And so we see the position of the star in a particular place, but in reality, what's happening is that that light is getting bent around the sun due to gravity. Uh, in, in, uh, in appropriate system of coordinates, the, the path of the light is still a straight line. It's just that the space that it's traveling in is curved. And you can do that on even larger, much larger scales when you look at, uh, uh, say, distant galaxies and you're looking in the direction where there is some foreground uh, cluster of galaxies. So that's what you see here. Uh, I don't know if, I don't know if you can see my, the pointer of the mouse, um, but the, imagine that you're sitting here in the Milky Way at, at point three at the lower right, and you're looking in the distance uh, at a galaxy far away, but in between there's a, a massive cluster of galaxies and that cluster of galaxies acts like a lens and that lens is bending the light uh, as it passes through. And what we see, well, we'll see it straight ahead, but we would expect now again, because our eyes are telling us, our brains are telling us that light is coming in a straight line, we would actually expect to see a ring of this galaxy spread out. And in fact, that's what you see. This is uh, uh, a gravitational lens. So the, the, you see clearly in sort of this greenish color, the, the foreground cluster and the blue galaxy is, is the one that's being lensed in the background. And you see a bunch of them and they are in sort of this circular pattern. That's not a bunch of different galaxies. That's one in the same galaxy being lensed. It's, it's one galaxy, but multiple images of the same galaxy. The lens isn't perfect. So the, so the image is broken up into individual little pieces. It looks like several galaxies, but it's actually just one. And here's a, a more perfect configuration where a, a, a galaxy is being lensed. Uh, this galaxy is, is, is behind what you see as the lens there and is getting spread out into a near uh, circular shape. So the consequences of this is that the universe is either expanding or contracting. Now, when Einstein was developing the theory, this is what he found. He said, well, the universe is expanding or contracting. And he was upset by that. And so he tried to fix it because he thought the universe shouldn't be expanding or contracting. It should just be static. So he, and he introduced this notion of a cosmological constant to in fact stop the expansion. And I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. He actually could have, uh, maybe even should have known that the universe was expanding because the observations were already present at the time. And so, well, I say it could be expanding or contracting. Well, our particular universe is expanding, at least it's expanding now. Um, and the way it's expanding is through Hubble's law that the velocity of a, of a distant object uh, is uh, increasing proportional to uh, the distance uh, of that object. So what do we mean by this? Um, what do we mean by the universe expanding? So let's even consider the, that the space is flat. Now space time is not flat, so we have to be careful. So that's, that's what's driving the expansion. But we can think of the spatial part of the universe uh, as being flat. Uh, and it can expand even though its volume is infinite. And as I said, things are not moving apart in space, it's the space itself that's expanding. And so one way to see that is you know, to look at, uh, this is now just a two dimensional uh, slice of, of this flat spatial uh, universe. And I put what looked like some go pieces uh, representing either galaxies or clusters of galaxies at various coordinates uh, on, this, uh, on this grid. There's no center, right? If this is an infinite plane, there's no center. So there's no center to the expansion. There's no center to the universe. It's just an infinite plane in this case. And, and over time, it just grows. And the galaxies themselves are sitting at their proper coordinates. They're not moving locally, but they're moving, they are getting farther apart from each other simply because the space is expanding. Um, you can do the same thing with a, a, a curved space. In this case, it's easier to think about it and say a closed space, although you don't have to. For a closed space, the volume is actually finite, uh, this, and, but it's still growing. And now you would put your galaxies at you know, various latitude and longitude 
positions, it, of course, in reality, you'd have to add your third coordinate as well. And you could do that as a third uh, angular coordinate if you wanted to. And that's expanding. And now, again, there is no center. Now, your mind is telling you, yeah, but there is a center. There's a center in, in, the, in that sphere. But the only thing that's in our universe, because we've reduced ourselves to, to two dimensions instead of three, the only thing in our universe is that surface. There is no inside of that surface. There is no outside of that surface. That surface is our universe. Now, in three space, you have to write down, draw a, a three-dimensional sphere, three-dimensional surface of a four-dimensional sphere. And we can't do that. We don't know how to do that. Our minds won't handle it. But just have to take that analogy. So there is no center on the surface of the sphere. There are poles, but that's by design. That's our choice of coordinate system. Now that sphere is expanding. And again, the galaxies are not moving on that coordinate system, but they are getting farther apart from each other. So that's what we mean by expansion. And what Hubble saw was that the, uh, he tracked out the velocity of these distant objects. And here the velocities, they're very fast, the kilometers per second here is the units on the, on, on the uh, velocity scale. And the distances are very large, uh, megaparsecs. So megaparsec is about 3 million light years. Uh, I think most of you in, should know about uh, that distance scale, parsecs. So I won't go into explaining it. So what do we have? We have an expanding universe that uh, leads us to this cosmological principle, which is based on homogeneity and isotropy. The universe is expanding basically the same, same way in all directions. As I said, that's very convenient because that allows us to make calculations, even more convenient if it's true. Now, Hubble measured the Hubble constant, what we call the Hubble constant, although it's not actually a constant, uh, to be about 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec, which means that if you put the galaxy at a megaparsec, to uh, the speed of 500 kilometers per second. Uh, unfortunately, in the Big Bang theory, that would imply that the age of the universe is about one to two billion years old, which is a little bit uh, embarrassing if the, uh, if the age of the Earth is four billion years old. So uh, that apparent inconsistency led to some competing theories, which is fine. Uh, eventually, it's, it's known that the Hubble constant is not 500. It's probably more like 70, uh, which allows you to have a universe old enough to, to account for all its constituents. But two of the leading candidates, uh, theories that were sort of touted around from the 1940s and on uh, were the Big Bang Theory uh, and the Steady State Theory. The Steady State Theory, uh, was main proponent was Fred Hoyle. He, in fact, named the Big Bang Theory. Uh, in fact, he, he did it in such a way to make it sound silly, to make it sound like that can't be the right thing, that, that, that Big Bang Theory. Whereas he had a nice scientific name for, for his theory, which is the steady state theory. Now, giving it a name doesn't help necessarily because uh, uh, later on these theories can be experimentally tested and verified or falsified. In the steady state theory, uh, it was falsified and the Big Bang theory makes some very definite predictions, which I'll come back to a little bit later, which were verified. So now let's try and get back to our history and go back to as close as we can to t equals to zero. So what happens at t equals to zero? Well, first of all, the volume of space should go to zero. Okay. The density of matter should become infinite. Gravity should become very, very strong because density is infinite. There's a lot of stuff there. Uh, but then if gravity gets strong, now you need a quantum theory. Uh, of gravity. And that might be string theory, as I said, but we don't know. We don't actually have a quantum theory of gravity. And that takes us to our slide again here, our chart. And the far left, you see a question mark, right? And we can't really say much. We can't say anything really before that point. And people do. It doesn't stop people from doing it. You can imagine all sorts of things. Uh, that might have gone on there, maybe a previous contraction of some, some previous universe, whatever, but we don't know. We don't know because we don't have a theory to be able to explain how gravity acts on such short time scales and such high energies. So we have, a, we have a question mark. Now, so that's our starting point really. All we know is that 
it's conceivable that the universe was once that dense and that hot and that energetic and that time scale was very, very short. So that's our beginning. Now, how does the universe expand from that point? Well, if it's dominated by radiation, and that means it's dominated either by photons, but, but other particles which are relativistic at the time, so moving very fast compared to their masses, the universe expands as a power law is just a very simple t to the one half. So it means over if, if time goes by by a factor of 100, the universe gets bigger by a factor of about 10. Matter dominated universe, so this would be true later on when, when, uh, when matter actually starts becoming the most important element of the universe because of its mass, and that might be regular matter, it might be dark matter uh, that I alluded to before, that also goes as a power law uh, is uh, t to the two thirds different power. Could be vacuum dominated. In that case, it goes as an exponential. So uh, R is going, growing very fast. So that's exponential expansion, but you should have been puzzled because what do I mean that the universe is dominated by a vacuum? Um, because most people think of vacuum as the absence of things. And so if you, don't, if you have a vacuum, you don't have anything in it, and how can that dominate over everything else? So we need to understand what we mean by a vacuum. So the vacuum in the sense of quantum mechanics is not the same thing as just being space without anything in it. In fact, vacuum tells you what the properties of particles are once you put them in that vacuum. And so here's a diagram. It's, I don't think it's too complicated of a diagram. If, if you throw away a lot of the words and you don't worry about that. Um, this is, a, this is a, a diagram of a phase transition. And everybody's familiar with certain phase transitions. And the one I wanna pick on is just going from steam to water for a second. And you see there are these things, T greater than T critical, T equal to T critical, T equals zero. So now just imagine that, that we're talking about temperature. So temperatures that are high. So let's say the critical temperature was 100 degrees and we're at temperatures much larger than that, then H2O would be in the form of steam. So you imagine now if this is filling your universe and you have a universe completely filled with steam. The universe cools, hits the critical temperature and what's gonna happen? Droplets are gonna form. So you're gonna have like little droplets filled with liquid inside. And as the temperature continues to cool, more and more of that steam will convert to droplets, eventually the entire universe will be filled with water, okay? Now I went down here to t equals to zero, so that won't apply to H2 anymore because then it would freeze obviously, but we're looking at one phase transition at a time. So this particular phase transition that I've sort of described here is one where you're going from this grand unified symmetry, so the one where strong and electroweak interactions are unified, to what we call the standard model where the strong and electroweak interactions are separate. And that happens just like droplets forming through bubbles forming, but they're bubbles of vacuum. So there is nothing in the bubble, there's nothing out of the bubble, but if you did put something in or out of the bubble, it would behave very differently. All the energy difference between the two are stored in that wall. And there is energy difference, and that's what's denoted here by V of zero. Uh, and that's the difference in energy between these two vacua. And that energy difference gravitates. And that energy difference actually then acts like uh, a cosmological constant. And that's what we mean by dominated by the vacuum. We're dominated by a different state of the vacuum. And what that does is then cause the universe to expand exponentially. So that brings us back to this cosmological constant that I mentioned. And you could say, is this Einstein's biggest blunder or is it another stroke of genius for him? Because it's his blunder because he, he was embarrassed by it because he didn't realize the universe was expanding and he only introduced this constant to stop the expansion. And it's a stroke of genius because he introduced it uh, because it could be introduced and it might be the thing that's dominating the universe today. Today, it happens to be very small. Uh, if you make a dimensionless number out of it, so multiply it by Newton's constant, it's 10 to the minus 121, which is probably the smallest number in physics. 
So that brings us to inflation. So the word meaning that you have this kind of exponential expansion due to this vacuum energy density due to this phase transition between forces in the universe. Now, inflation was proposed to settle some mysteries in the universe. One is we really still don't know for sure if the universe is open or closed. Is it flat? It seems to be very close to being flat, but it could still be open, which means finite in volume or closed, uh, sorry, closed in finite in volume or open infinite volume. There's a parameter we call omega, which is just the total density of whatever it is you're looking at divided by a critical density. And that critical density is what's needed to, if you want, close the universe or make it flat. If omega is one, the, the spatial part of the universe is flat. It seems that even after 13.8 billion years, we still don't know for sure. You thought, well, why isn't it 10? Why isn't it a million? Why isn't it 0.1 or 10 to the minus five? It seems to even after 10, the, even after 13 year, billion years, it's very close to one. Then going back to the homogeneity and isotropy, why is the universe so homogeneous and isotropic? It can't just be because it's convenient for us to do calculations. How did it get to be that way? It certainly didn't have to be. It could have been a real mess and we wouldn't have been able to calculate, but you know that's too bad for us, but it does appear to be very homogeneous and isotropic. And that's also a mystery. And that's, even, that's evidenced by this uh, microwave background that I alluded to and I'll come back to shortly. It's another oddity, and I just bring it up for amusement. Uh, you can ask the question, where are the magnetic monopoles? You might say, well, what is a magnetic monopole? Well, these are predicted by these same grand unified theories. Now, you may have on occasion, maybe not, I think people don't do it so often anymore, go on to a hardware store to buy a magnet. And any magnet that you buy uh, will typically come in this kind of configuration. It could be a bar, it could be a horseshoe, it doesn't matter, but it'll have a north and a south pole. I bet you never thought to go into the hardware store and ask to buy either a North Pole or a South Pole. You can't say, I want a bag of six North Poles. It just doesn't work that way, but it could. And you could ask, why not? Why isn't the universe filled with North Poles separate from South Poles? So what is inflation? Inflation is a transition in the early universe. It goes from a vacuum dominated expansion to uh, a power law expansion. So after inflation is done, you're dominated by radiation. Uh, and it's inflation that actually creates these very little uh, density uh, fluctuations that were actually caused by quantum fluctuations. And these are things that have been tested now. Uh, and I'll, as I, I'll show that in, in just a few minutes. And it solves all these problems. The universe just got very, very big. As you get big, it gets flat. We already said that in the beginning that it, it appears very flat because it's so big. But now inflation made it really big, unimaginably big. So it's, it should be indistinguishable from flat. And that's why we see it as flat today. It also smoothed everything out. So we expect it to be homogeneous and isotropic. And it diluted the monopole. So maybe there's a North Pole floating around somewhere, but maybe only one in the observable universe. And I said, this is testable from observations in the microwave background radiation. So that takes us through our second bar. And now you see right after that second bar, you see this quick expansion. This is the inflationary. This is blowing up the universe, not the scale, of course, but making it immensely, immensely big. And then we're filled, the universe after inflation is filled with radiation. All particles that could exist uh, should be present in the universe after a uh, period of inflation. So the next thing that happens right there um, is that uh, we have to somehow separate matter from antimatter. And so that brings up a few other questions. What is antimatter? Where is the antimatter? And again, it's actually the role of grand unified theories that comes in. So when Dirac was uh, trying to combine uh, quantum mechanics with uh, relativity, he found that uh, every particle needed to have an antiparticle. He was working on a theory for the electron. He found you needed to have a similar particle, which is called the positron. And similarly, all particles have either distinct antiparticles or, or are their own antiparticles. Proton, which is made of three quarks, uh, which is called, also called the baryon, is, uh, has an antiparticle called the antiproton made of three antiquarks, and so forth. You have mesons and neutrinos and antineutrinos. Photons are their own antiparticles. 
And these are observed, they're observed in cosmic rays. You can produce them accelerators. This is an old picture from a bubble chamber. Uh, this was, I think, taken at, uh, at CERN in Geneva uh, where you have uh, particles going in, neutral particle might come in and collide with a nucleus. If it's high energy, it will particles. You see a bunch of them here. Those are particle antiparticle pairs getting produced. So uh, you need uh, a force which can change matter to antimatter, or at least change the, the, uh, uh, the nature of these things. And, and for that, uh, you again have to go back to grand unification because the standard model, the, the forces that we know about have force carriers for electromagnetism, it's just the photon. For the weak force, it's called the W plus minus and Z. These were particles first observed in the early 80s at CERN in Geneva. Uh, for the strong force, it's a particle called the gluon. There's actually eight of them. Uh, and gravity, it's the graviton, which was observed in some sense for the first time about uh, six years ago uh, through gravitational waves. Grand unification predicts two additional uh, force carriers, they're generically called X and Y. Uh, and similar to what happens for, with a neutron, neutrons decay via the weak force, and that's a little bit what's responsible for radioactivity. So a neutron will decay into a proton because the W mediates the interaction producing the electron and an antineutrino that lifetime is about 10 minutes has to do with the W mass. Grand unified theory would predict that protons decay. And so you have a proton on the left made of the three quarks mediated by this new force and you end up with a positron and this DD bar is actually a pion. And this lifetime is proportional to the mass of this new particle, which is very heavy uh, it hasn't been seen, so it's, this is still speculation, but that tells you that the lifetime of the proton is an immensely long uh, lifetime. And I'll let you think about how that would ever be observable. So all of that takes place in this very early part. Now, I'll be very brief on the next two phase transitions. There are two more of importance here. One is that electroweak transition that happens about a 10th of a nanosecond after the Big Bang. Um, and that's where the weak nuclear force and electromagnetic force appear to be different. And if you've heard of the Higgs boson, uh, that's where that comes in. The Higgs boson is what drives this electroweak transition uh, and adjusts the vacuum state. So just like the gut to the uh, standard model transition, now we have another one, which is again, a transition of, between two different vacua and now particles actually get their masses. A little bit later, at about uh, 10 to 100 microseconds or so, you have the transition between quarks, which are the fundamental constituents subject to the strong force. And that gets changed over to what are called hadrons. These include neutrons and protons. They're the particles that we're made of that are subject to the strong force. So the, the quarks and gluons then bind to form hadrons. And that's so here at 10 to the minus 10 seconds, you have the, trans the electroweak transition. So the Ws disappear because they get to be very heavy. And now the universe is filled with quarks and some electrons, some other particles. And then these bind at 10 to the minus four seconds. Now you see the quark antiquarks or three quarks bind into these hadronic particles. QQQ might be a proton, this might be a neutron and so forth. So that takes us now up to um, the period of nucleosynthesis. And that, uh, I would say, is probably the foundation of Big Bang cosmology uh, and has a very close relationship with the microwave background, which was uh, observed 16 years after it was predicted. And let me explain that briefly. So these are the people that are really responsible for what we call now the modern Big Bang theory. And of course, it all comes from Einstein's theory of relativity, but Modern Big Bang cosmology comes from, from these three, George Gamow, his student Ralph Alpher, and his research associate, uh, Robert uh, Herman. Often, uh, it's associated with these three in a slightly different order, uh, Alpher, Beta, and Gamow. And if you say it fast enough, you'll, you'll get why it's a little bit amusing. Uh, I had the, the, uh, uh, the, the pleasure of actually hearing this from Beta himself when I was a graduate student. Uh, Beta came to the University of Chicago to give us a talk, and he was asked about this paper. There's a paper by Alpha, Beta, and Gamow. It's really the work of Alpha and Gamow in this case, 
uh, Gamow had an immense sense of humor and sent, he really wanted a paper with these three author title, uh, three author names and sent it to Beta. Beta himself said, well, he read the paper. He didn't see anything obviously wrong with it and, uh, and agreed to, to have his name as, as the middle author. Uh, this is one of the more famous papers in, in uh, early papers in cosmology. Uh, what they were trying to do, what Gamow and his group was trying to do, was to, to um, predict the abundances of all of the elements in the periodic table. Well, the periodic table wasn't quite as big as this when he, they were doing it, uh, but this is what they were trying to do. And they failed. It didn't, it didn't really work uh, because it, it, it was too big of a task. You see there are three uh, of the elements that are, are highlighted in red, hydrogen, helium, and lithium. That's now what's associated with being produced in the Big Bang. Beryllium and boron are also a little bit um, uh, separate. Those are produced uh, predominantly in cosmic rays. Um, could be produced a little bit in the Big Bang, but mainly in cosmic rays. So they failed. Big Bang nucleosynthesis could not explain the abundances. And so that led to another field, uh, stellar nucleosynthesis. And that's now where we believe that the vast majority of, of the elements, the things that we're made up of, you know, carb everything carbon-based, all in oxygen, nitrogen, all of that came from stars. But stars can't explain everything. And there were some questions that lasted that, you know, why is there so much helium-4 in the universe? Why is it about 25% of the mass of normal stuff is in helium? And where did the deuterium come from? Deuterium is heavy hydrogen. It's the it's binding of a, a proton and a neutron. And it turns out that nucleosynthesis can account for that. And so that led to a resurgence of nucleosynthesis. And that's what's going on here in our diagram at about 100 seconds. You have all of a sudden these individual neutrons and protons, if you want, now combining to form, in this case, you know, would be deuterium. This, might, this would be hydrogen. Three might be either tritium or helium-3 with four of them. That would be your helium-4. So that's what's being displayed here. Now, let me come back to Alpha and Herman for a second. Uh, and I showed this paper because I think it's one of the most amazing papers uh, ever written in cosmology. And this is going back to 1948. I have to read everything here, but you'll see somewhere in this uh, panel here on the, in the lower left, in the middle of it, you see this five degrees. They actually, this is, they were trying to understand what was going on in their Big Bang model. This was still their model. Nobody else really worked on it. Um, and um, they said, well, you know, if all this is really happening today, there should be some radiation left over and it should be at about five degrees Kelvin. And they said, well, we're not really sure. Uh, there's some uncertainties in some of the numbers we put in. Maybe it's about one Kelvin. It should be between one and five Kelvin. This is what they said. And actually they were dissuaded from pursuing this because Gamow said, well, why are you wasting your time with this? Nobody's ever gonna measure radiation at, you know, at one to five degrees out in space. Well, he was wrong because in 1964, Penzias and Wilson, while they were trying to perfect a radio antenna to track a communication satellite, found some noise which they couldn't get rid of. And they didn't exactly know off off the top what that noise was, but the people, this was at Bell Labs in, in New Jersey, and, but the people down the road in Princeton did know, and, um, and they understood that this was what they were, that noise they had was the remnant from the Big Bang, and is exactly what uh, Alpha and Herman predicted. This was measured far better uh, later on with dedicated satellites. This is the COBE satellite and they, what they measured was uh, the temperature to high precision, 2.7255 degrees Kelvin. Um, this is their early measurement. Uh, the, the curve there is, is not a fit. It's, it's, just, it's just a pure black body, theoretical black body. You could have drawn that curve uh, in the early 1900s if you told the temperature. It just depends on that one number, the temperature. And the little boxes are there are their observations. This is the most perfect black body you can produce. You can't get one like this in a laboratory. This is the universe. There have been a number of satellites. So you had um, COBE in 1992. Uh, it was followed up by WMAP um, in 2001. And now what you're seeing here, what, what Penzias and Wilson saw was a uniform temperature of 2.7 degrees. What COBE did not only was to see this black body radiation, 
uh, so perfectly, they also saw the first evidence of the fluctuations that the universe, even though it's, we say it's isotropic and homogeneous, it's not exactly so. They're seeing temperature differences here on the order of about 10 micro Kelvin. And WMAP took that to much, much higher resolution. And that was followed up uh, very recently by the Planck satellite, which gave its first results in 2015 and final results in 2018. And this is the resolution that you get from Planck. Uh, and again, the difference between red and blue here is about 10 micro Kelvin. Now, what Planck did to extremely high precision and following the work of WMAP is this plot here. And I'm not gonna explain it in detail, but what I'll say is that the curve here again is a theory curve. It's not really, it's, it's sort of a fit, but it's a theory curve based on about six parameters. And you see their data, it's a little bit sloppy on the left, but that's because you don't get to observe very, this is large scale. The left corresponds to very large scales or wide observing angles. And you only have so many observations in the universe that you can make that are distinct at, at large angles. Whereas on the right at small angles, you can make lots of them and get much better precision. So about six parameters, a ton of observations. And this is how the experiment fits the uh, theory. So it's really amazing. And part of what gets fit here are those density fluctuations predicted by inflation. So the implications from Planck are that it's a confirmation of inflation in some sense, the, 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 the imprint of these density fluctuations. It also tells you something about the composition of the universe today, dark energy, dark matter, and ordinary matter. So there are these omegas again, that's the fraction of matter, both ordinary and dark matter, and the fraction in a cosmological constant or dark energy, if you want. And this is what uh, the Planck satellite tells us. The line here is if you're in a flat universe and the best fit is something very, very flat with about 30% matter and about 70% cosmological constant. And that's why I say another stroke of genius for, for Einstein. And this is sort of the pie chart that divides everything up. Most of the universe today is this dark energy. And th what that means is that the universe is now, its expansion is accelerating and will continue to accelerate uh, to move away from this sort of power law expansion to this exponential expansion. So in the next few billion years, you know, watch out, the universe will be expanding very quickly. So the microwave background was released here about 100,000 years after the Big Bang, a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, when you form first form neutral atoms. So now the photons that were left over from the Big Bang can now free stream and get to our detectors. And then maybe about a billion years after that, you get the first stars, the first, I think that's on the next slide. Um, you have neutral matter forms, and then you enter what's called the dark ages that lasted about a billion years because it's dark because you have those photons, but they're very cold. Uh, and you have to wait until those density fluctuations from inflation turn into the first structures as dwarf galaxies and eventually clusters of galaxies. And eventually you get the first stars and the first light which I guess you guys are all pretty happy about because otherwise you wouldn't have much of a uh, chance to go observing if not for that, we wouldn't be here. So I go back to this picture now, we've gone through the full history. I spent, as I said, uh, particle cosmology or early universe cosmology, we concentrate on the left side of this, people worrying about uh, the high redshift universe, I haven't talked about redshift, but uh, maybe you know what that means a uh, high redshift universe where you're looking at distant galaxies, that's all on the right part of this. So it's just two branches of cosmology. And hopefully you've learned a little bit now about the left side of this diagram. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Keith, for your, that uh, excellent talk. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. So here I am up at LLCC and I, I'm in the room with about 20 people. I'm wondering if there's any questions from anyone. Paul, let me see how far I can stretch the microphone. Tell us something about the vacuum fluctuation or particles popping and out of existence. Um, I caught a little bit of it, uh, but maybe if somebody, if you can repeat, if Mark, you can repeat the question, that would make it easier for me and probably anybody else listening right. in. But he's talking about uh, fluctuations in the vacuum and particles popping in and out. 
yeah, in and out of existence. Right. Right. So if you look at the vacuum at very short time scales, so it, it, this, the easiest way to explain this is, you know, through what's called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You have something like that, you know, the delta E is the change in energy times the change in time has to be bigger than Planck's constant. So if you look at the vacuum at very, very short times, you can't be sure really how much energy is there. And so in that sense, you can imagine on short time scales, particle antiparticle pairs appearing and disappearing. Now, if you wait a long time, that's, you won't see anything, it'll appear empty. But on very short time scales, if you can probe the vacuum, um, the shorter the time scale, the more massive particle you might be able to produce out of that vacuum. Good. Are there any experiments looking for that today or doing, trying to do that? Um, sure, there are. Those are there are all sorts of quantum mechanical experiments. They're mostly uh, would be in, in condensed matter type environments where you uh, you can probe uh, the properties of the vacuum. Uh, it is uh, it's I could say it's, it's well known quantum mechanics. It's well known. This is well known, very well studied science. Uh, now. That's not to say the electroweak vacuum, that's just to say our vacuum where we're looking at the way the universe is today. The electroweak vacuum, the kind of phase transitions I was talking about, uh, attempts to probe that would be through high energy collisions. And that's of course uh, more difficult to, uh, uh, to get clear answers out of. Well, what I'm trying to get at is the universe is just a particle mm -hmm. and popped into existence. Did you hear that? Is it is Not the really. universe is the universe a particle that just popped out of existence? Well, out of I wouldn't say the universe is a particle, but now again, the the, the business about popping out um, is uh, is in that question mark. So you know, I I don't want to try and give the impression that we understand the origin of the universe whether it was a fluctuation that, yes, popped out of something, but again, it's not popped out of something into something, right? Because the Big Bang, at least again, in the classical theory, in the sense of, of relativity, what's also created at the same instant is our notion of space and time. All of the universe was created at once. All of what we consider as time is created at once. That's again, extrapolating to zero and into that question mark. And so without that theory of gravity, that, that higher theory of gravity, there would be no way to answer it. Um, just like Newton would never be able to answer anything to do with relativity because it's just uh, too much of an approximation. Okay, so there's, there's one in the chat. line, yeah. Uh, there's a question in the chat saying, inflation has always seemed rather ad hoc to me. Thanks for providing, oh, okay, so not so much a question. Um, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not really ad hoc. It's, uh, there are a lot of theories that we don't know the correct theory of inflation. There are, there are several of them, but they all sort of share the same general features in terms of leading to this accelerated expansion, leading to these uh, quantum fluctuations that eventually grow to, uh, uh, to the observable structure in the universe today and the flatness. Cool. It makes other predictions that are, 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 are being looked for even as, as we speak. Uh, uh, the, uh, the microwave background, I said, we measure the, 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 uh, the temperature. You also measure um, the fluctuations in the temperature, but people are now looking for the uh, polarization in the microwave background. And that has been, um, uh, that there, there's a prediction about that from inflation and we're hoping within the next five to 10 years that sensitivities to measure the polarization in the microwave background will yield uh, more information about inflation. One more question from up here at LLCC. Sure. Hello. Um, so you may have touched on this a little bit in your talk, but I wanted to flesh it out a little bit more. So the Higgs boson that was discovered a few years ago, that was supposed to be the God particle. Uh, how close are we to the unification of uh, quantum mechanics and the Big Bang Theory and the rest. Okay, so the Higgs, um, uh, the Higgs particle was, uh, it, 
The God particle is because it plays such an important role and is responsible for all the masses. And uh, so the electron gets its mass from the Higgs, the quarks get their masses from the Higgs, the W gets its mass from the Higgs, everything comes from that that symmetry breaking, that, that phase transition from the electroweak to the, to the weak and electromagnetic interactions. So that was proposed in 1964, Higgs and others uh, proposed uh, that it should be a particle. It really, Higgs gets the, the name because instead of just being sort of this more mathematical construct, Higgs actually said, well, it should actually be a real particle. And um, it's, it, it, it has been, its role in this electroweak unification was beautifully laid out in, that, in a paper by Weinberg in 67. And that the theory behind the Higgs was developed from then until its, its observation about uh, eight years ago. And so it, the proper, everything about the Higgs uh, is, it was incredibly well understood except its mass. Nobody knew exactly what its mass was or the same thing really, it, the self interactions, interactions between Higgs particles and themselves. So that was the one thing that prevented its, its discovery any earlier. It's just basically it was too heavy and it, it, you needed a machine like the LHC at CERN to actually produce it and being able to measure it. So the Higgs was extremely well understood and its role in the theory is extremely well understood. Um, now, is it a unique particle or are there more than one Higgs? Are there many Higgses? Um, there should be different Higgses associated with grand unified theories. Um, of course, those are gonna be extremely heavy and so you can only observe them indirectly either through something like proton decay or other very, very rare uh, processes. So people still search for that, but that, that hasn't been discovered. So Higgs now sort of now covers more than just the one particle that was definitively discovered. So in terms of unifying it with gravity, that there might be other particles that, that play some kind of role in how you understand why gravity is different from the other forces, but that's much less certain or, and much less understood. Okay, one more question up here. Actually, wait, Mark. Okay. Um, Mark has a question here. Plus, there's a couple in chat. Okay. We'll take okay. the chat first. Yep. No, go ahead, Mark. Uh, it's actually two questions. One is: It possible that the rate of the expansion could vary from d different regions of the space, from uh, far away to close in, or depending on the masses that are around it. And the second one is. How can science tell if the universe is still expanding when the data from light and radio emissions, the signals are in the millions, if not billions of years old? Okay, uh, let me, so for, let's, let's go for the first one first. Um, it's, it's a great question because that sort of runs into the heart of this idea of homogeneity and isotropy. Um, if the universe were inhomogeneous or anisotropic, then indeed it could be expanding differently in different, uh, in different directions. Uh, and in principle, it could be doing so uh, very noticeably. So there's a whole class. So if you just give up isotropy, and so you just say the universe is still homogeneous and, but it's, it's anisotropic. It looks different in different directions, but it's still, the matter is still uniformly distributed. Um, those, you can, they're much more complicated, but you can still study that uh, analytically and, and, and make predictions and you, you, you would have all your models to, to be able to handle that. Um, but it doesn't appear that that's the case. It appears that the universe is, is expanding in different directions all at the same, at the same rate. And that is then evidenced in, in extremely strongly by the uniformity of the microwave background. So if, if, uh, if it was really expanding differently then what you would see in different directions it would be maybe three degrees in one direction, five degrees in another direction, two degrees in, one, in another direction, it would just be all over. And the fact that it's 2.7255 everywhere up to the level of tens of microkelvin 
tells us that the universe is expanding uniformly in all directions. Now, um, how do we know? Uh, well, it's basically th through a comparison of the observations to what the predictions of the theory are. So you do look at very distant objects. So now at cosmological difference distances. So you know, even up to you know billion light years away, um, you're looking at the most di distant objects, uh, and um, they fit the pattern of of a universe which is expanding um, uh, uh, uniformly. And actually that's, once you get to the very large distances, you, you actually, you have a deviation from Hubble's law. Hubble's law, uh, it might sound funny to you, is only valid for short distances. Now, short distances are still, you know, megaparsecs, you know, many megaparsecs. It's only when you get to really cosmological distances that that breaks down. That linear law, uh, Hubble's law, is, is really just an approximation. And then the deviation from that depends on really what's in the universe. And, you know, is it made of matter? Is it made of radiation? How much of each? You know, is it made of dark energy? And it's those observations, in fact, the very distant observations of um, supernova, if, if you know, type 1, type 1A one supernova are thought to be more or less standard candles. There's still some discussion about that. But um, even though it got a Nobel Prize, uh, uh, they're the ones that are telling you uh, how the universe is expanding at very, very large distances. And it appears that it's very much uh, in line with this idea that uh, we're dominated by about uh, uh, two to one in dark energy to dark matter. So you answered both questions there? Yes, I, I hope so. <laughs> oh boy, okay. Because I got lost, I couldn't keep up. So. Uh, he did. Okay. One question online on the, through the chat from Thor is, what is the experimental measure lower limit of the stability of the proton? It's about the 10 to the 32 years. Uh, well, yeah, it, depend, it, de it depends on uh, which channel, right? You, you set limits on the partial lifetimes, depending if the proton can decay. I, I showed one of it going to a positron and a pion, but there are other decay channels as well. It's about the 10 to the 32 years. Uh, that is the experimental limit. Uh, the initial prediction was that it should be about 10 to the, the lifetime should be about 10 to the 30. And so starting in the late seventies, there were a whole slew of experiments uh, looking for proton decay, including a very major one in Minnesota um, at the Sudan mine. Uh, that's when um, uh, a lot of particle physics began in the Sudan mine with an experiment uh, looking for proton decay. And so here you're taking a lot of material, you know, tons of material and, and waiting to see uh, a particular proton in that bulk decay. Uh, so it, they're very difficult experiments and uh, the limits keep getting a little bit better, but you know, um, there's, it's going to be hard to stretch it too much farther. There's more experiments planned, mostly in Japan now, uh, that should get you out to about 10 to the 33 years or so. Um, but, you know, if, if the real lifetime is 10 to the 34, 10 to the 35, um, you know, if you're waiting for one decay, you know, if it takes you 10 years to get one decay to get you 10 to the 33 years and you find the lifetime is 10 to the 34, it means you have to wait 100 years for that one decay. So it's, it's very difficult uh, to do better. So there's another question about is uh, um, why is the universe expansion accelerating? Uh, because of the because of the uh, the dark energy. So the, uh, the I mean it, it's a little bit hard to explain because I you know used to doing it with you know if I could show you an equation it would be trivial but. Um, it, it's a, it's a question of, in Einstein's equations, you have your solution to your space time, and then you have a source, what you put in, in the universe. If you put in just normal matter, you would find that the universe is expanding, but as a power law. And, and this is what Einstein found right away. He just had a source. He just put some energy density into the universe, and he found, oh, it's expanding. And that's why he needed to do something fiddling to make it not expand. The, the natural thing is either or contract, it's just a change of sound. But um, if there is still some leftover, and now I would call it vacuum energy density. So if there's, 
if, if our vacuum is not sitting at zero, absolutely at zero, and it's got a little bit left over, and that's it's very, very little, it's just that's really tiny number I mentioned, then all of a sudden that little bit starts to gravitate. You see that it's a little bit, but the universe is very big and it's a constant over the entire universe. That little bit, now all of a sudden it starts driving the universe and instead of being this power law expansion, it's an exponential expansion, which is the same as acceleration. All right, very good. Uh, one final question in there is um, most interesting and outstanding questions and mysteries um, out there for young scientists to focus on. Oh, there's 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 a there's a lot of them. I mean, there's so many things we don't know uh, about about the universe. That that question's coming from my grandson, by the way, which is oh okay. Uh, <laughs> So maybe, maybe you got to take them and do a one-on-one -on -one with him. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a lot of questions. I, the, cosmological constant question is, is a huge one, but that one's been around for a long time. It's not clear we're going to get a solution to that one anytime soon. Um, I think that you, one of the most promising things are, is, is, the, uh, is the polarization of the microwave background, if we're talking about learning about early universe cosmology. Uh, and there are a lot of planned uh, experiments that are uh, an ongoing experience looking for that. Uh, but there's so much going on. There's so much new stuff going on with uh, gravitational waves now. We're starting to learn a lot more about, uh, you know, collisions of black holes, collisions of neutron stars, uh, you know, what makes up a lot of the uh, heavier elements in the universe. Uh, this is, it's a good time for astrophysics. There's a whole field that, that goes now under the, the name multi-messenger um, astronomy, where you're looking at different things at the same time, uh, gravitational waves, you're looking at it, the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, you could, you know, if you're lucky, you can maybe get neutrino signals if there's something happening. So there's, there's a lot still to learn. We know a lot. I think it's amazing how much we do know, but, and how well this very simple theory, I mean, it, it's really based on just a few parameters and how well it tracks what, what's actually observed in the It's still not as complicated as that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, one, that more one, I, one more question in the room. Oh, they're picking on me. Never mind. Never mind the, 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 the people behind the curtain. So one more question in the room here from, from Greg Hombrick. Hi, I, I was wondering, uh, do we know much about the singularity involved in the Big Bang based on conservation of mass and energy and our knowledge of the universe today? Um, no, so the if I heard it correctly, do we know much about the singularity uh, uh, at, uh, in, in the universe and space-time singularity? Um, no, we don't. Uh, again, that goes, that's in that question mark. Um, uh, you know, does the, does, the, does the density really go to, to, to become infinite? Does, you know, when T goes to zero? Probably not, right? The, you know, what was there before? I don't know. It could have been, you know, some kind of space-time foam that, that, that things popped out of. Um, you know, if I, inflation sort of sidesteps this issue. So there's a, uh, and it's not really, I, I generally don't say it's part of science because it's completely untestable. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's incredibly possible that that's actually what went on. Inflation, I said, is this transition. Now, now, inflation didn't have to have a start. You didn't have to start with something and inflate it. You could have imagined that the universe is always inflating. So the universe was always here. So, you, you know, the T equals zero doesn't really mean anything. The universe is, is inflating. And what's happening is that in some pocket of space, that uh, all of a sudden the universe, uh, boy, if I had a blackboard or something, I could draw a picture and that would make it a whole lot easier uh, to explain. But um, inflation is driven by something like a Higgs field actually, and it evolves. And it could be that in most of the universe, it's in a state which is still driving this exponential expansion. And in some regions, it's just quantum fluctuations that take you out of this and all of a sudden, the field starts going to the true vacuum that, that we eventually are, need to be living in. And while that's happening, our patch of this 
now, you know, if you think the universe is big, this thing that I'm talking about is, you know, exponentially times larger than that. But some big patch inflated, and we live in that big inflated patch. But outside, outside, not not outside, literally outside, but far, far away, it would still be expanding. Now, why do I say that that's outside of science and can never be tested? Because there could be then other patches like that. So if you want other universes that are like ours that are connected by exponentially expanding space time. It's not testable because those other patches are actually moving away from us. And you're not gonna like this, but it's okay. Away from us faster than the speed of light. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> send a signal from that other patch to us, um, you'll never know. And so you'll never be able to measure, you'll never know that it's there. Um, things can go, it, it's really not faster than light. Light is still going at the speed of light, it's just that the distance it covers is faster than you would expect by just taking CT. Even, even today, uh, when we ask for what is the distances to very distant things, uh, in, in, in a radiation-dominated universe, um, distances go as twice the speed of light. Uh, in a radiation-dominated universe, it's three times the speed of light. And it's just because the universe is curved. And so on that scale, it's curved a lot. And so it looks like it's going faster than the speed of light. Speed, light is still going at the speed of light. But we'll never get a signal, so it's not testable. So I. I it could be true, but it's more metaphysical than physical. Well, I want to thank you for your time tonight. Um, it's it's awesome. I think uh, I think we had a great time. I hope you did. I hope you come back again sometime in the future. And uh, sure, I mean it would be great to be in a place where we're all you know human bodies and looking at each other and smiling and absolutely, that'd be great. And uh, you know, we'll certainly work on that and and. Uh, We'll get there one day. So thank you very much for your time. Sure. My pleasure. I was from the room here in, uh, in, in Long Lake. So thank you. And the rest of us, uh, thank you all for coming here. And thank you for all you online. It was uh, it's great to see you. So 